given enough time, enough statism, enough coercion that's monopolized and worse legitimized by, by government, uh, the culture itself will start changing, forming around the norms that the state has imposed upon its hapless subjects, which was more or less you know, was kind of getting at. So when you look at the first realm, I guess I guess in a lot of ways it is the state plus the culture and maybe even more things like the psychology of authoritarianism and so forth, where it's even how pe people approach problems. Like, oh, there's this problem in the world, let's use coercion and then, you, and then paper it over with a lot of flowery rhetoric and then people will get on our side and agree with us. Same thing here with the second realm. Whatever second realm activities uh, people are going to participate in, I wouldn't be surprised if there's going to be some degree of emotional resistance and or some sort of guilt, maybe even shaming to some degree that they may feel, even if it's only internal. And I would just suggest that maybe a good prescription for that might be some form of if not counseling, at least encouragement. Let's call it encouragement, because I can't think of a better word for it. I think encouragement would be good. Like, hey, you're doing nothing wrong. If anything, you're actually doing the world a lot of good by following your own self-interest and exercising your individual autonomy. Not And, and not only that, but not only keep doing that, uh, actually, wait, hold on, do more of that. <laughs> Yeah, go farther. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think that emotional component being manipulated by the social conditioning is something to not ignore, but instead try and find solutions for, even if it's just encouragement from other second realm uh, traders that, uh, hey, you know, uh, you know, this, you know, this is these are our principles. This is why we're doing this. And we're going to keep not only keep on keeping on, but we're going to do more. You know, Sam Konkin kind of envisioned the different phases of an Agora society, or excuse me, of an emerging Agora society of sorts. So like, for example, he mentioned, now technically, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, technically right now we're in a low density, what he called a low density Agora society, meaning that Agoras exists at all. There may not be very many, but they're here. Um, the next one was mid density, small condensation Agora society. And then the next one after that is a high density large condensation agora society then of course after that the winning phase if you will is the agora society with statist impurities i would suggest i'm not thoroughly convinced i would say it's an it's arguable that it would be either the mid-density small condensation agora society or the high density large condensation agora society would be another way of describing a more developed second realm in some sense so I do think there's kind of an overlap of that, where as, as, as the Agoras have certain areas that they essentially, mm, they essentially liberate from the state because, because they're closer to being revolutionaries, although not quite, um, that as they, shall we say, liberate certain areas, um, that by default, those liberated areas are kind of like a second realm, almost by default, or at least a potential second realm. And I think that's something to kind of keep in mind. So, you know, as, as we, as, as individuals gain more and more liberty just by, you know, exercising it mainly, and also working in tandem with each other as, as, as they can and are willing to and so forth, I, th I view this kind of as a win-win-win. There's basically, you know, the Agoras win by getting closer to abolishing the state through gray and black market trading by developing their Agoras networks of trade. The Venuans win by gaining a greater invulnerability to coercion that they had before, and the Second Realmers win by basically building, well, a much more effective Second Realm than they had before. So that's why I said win-win-win three ways. For most readers of this blog, the above probably is a trivial truism, nothing to talk about again. However, it is not that simple. From that cornerstone comes the key to how people should live together, 
since they cannot realistically escape it, nor should they, and thus the basics for what governs the Second Realm. In short, it is the argument for autonomy. Autonomy refers to the legitimacy and ability of single individuals making decisions for themselves and giving themselves a moral law by which to operate. This does not mean that they will always be smart and successful in their decision making, nor that their choices will be intellectually defendable or theologically sound for those that care. By no means. It only erects a borderline, a sphere that no other human being can justifiably ignore and trespass. The core of asserting autonomy is to see that it is the individual making choices for himself, not others choosing for him, nor he choosing for others. It is the line in the sand that says, this is where I am the only one to decide. The Taz as a conscious radical tactic will emerge under certain conditions. 1. Psychological liberation. That is, we must realize, make real, the moments and spaces in which freedom is not only possible, but actual. We must know in what ways we are genuinely oppressed, and also in what ways we are self-repressed, or ensnared in a fantasy in which ideas oppress us. Work, for example, is a far more actual, far more actual source of misery for most of us than legislative politics. Alienation is far more dangerous for us than toothless, outdated, dying ideologies. Mental addiction to ideals, which in fact turn out to be more projections of our resentment and sensations of victimization, will we'll, uh, we'll never further our project. The Taz is not a harbinger of some pie-in-the-sky social utopia to which we must sacrifice our lives, that, uh, our lives that our children's children may breathe a bit of free air. The Taz must be the scene of our present autonomy, but it can only exist on the condition that we already know ourselves as free beings. A proxy merchant is a bridge connecting the second realm to the first realm, while keeping risks at bay. Many ways of bridge building are conceivable, from people who handle exchanges between second realm money and official currencies to shopping and trading agents. We leave it, we leave it to the reader to invent his own niche. I want to speak to one other thing in this uh, in this paragraph, but uh, the Yakuza forbid their members to partake in theft. Wow! So at least in this regard, the Yakuza is preferable to the state. I don't know what yep. else they did. Uh, sure, there was some bad stuff there, but they don't didn't allow their members to steal. That's pretty uh, pretty incredible, <laughs> right? Well, it's definitely an improvement. Yeah, it, it's just I don't know, man. The more I've looked at organized crime, it, it's definitely. Lesser, you know, people talk about lesser of two evils during an election. That's a false dichotomy. I think, I think a better dichotomy is: Do you want government or do you want organized crime? If you had a real choice to make, just between the two, not a third option right. or anything isn't, else. Isn't that the argument against anarcho-capitalism? Is that you just have these, uh, um, yeah. these, these organized criminal criminal corporations, so to speak? Yeah. Uh, yeah so yeah, I mean, I, you know, which one would I? Uh, you know, I, I mean, we, we, we've seen the clear-cut results of the state uh, over the, you know, since the beginning of of, uh, of human human beings. Uh, let's try something different, <laughs> even though it may not be the most pre preferable. But they're also, thing. but but they're uh, also, but the shot. people, but the people who are also saying that are, are are kind of also making an assumption that the organized criminal syndicates aren't you know alive and operating today, even with the state around. And it's like, are you people mental? I'm sorry, have you not heard of the Komora, the Yakuza, the Triads, MS13? Oh, I almost forgot about them. Uh, let's start with the definition of tradecraft here. So tradecraft is the art of art of implementing the objectives of need to know. So that sounds a little vague, I guess, uh, but what I, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly get into that uh, more as we we get, we get into some excerpts from Second Round Book on Strategy. But uh, Kyle, what are your, your initial, uh, I guess, uh, preliminary thoughts on tradecraft? I think probably the term tradecraft the Second Realmers use in the book on strategy is probably the rough equivalent to what you and I understand to be security culture. Um, remember, security culture itself is concerned with the how of privacy, not the why of privacy. 
the assumption that security culture makes is that you either agree with or at least even if you disagree you at least comprehend why people value their privacy and therefore security culture is much more of a utilitarian thing it's more concerned with nuts and bolts and the goal of it is how do you make privacy happen practically in the real world um regarding tradecraft in in the context of the second realm I think it's going to be more or less synonymous. I think it's probably going to be more security culture, not security culture just broadly, but security culture as applied to essentially protect, not just protecting the second realm, but making the second realm functional in a practical utilitarian way. Um, shall we say maybe another way of def uh, a possibly defining tradecraft in this context would be, let's try this. Tradecraft is the how of the second realm, of making the second realm functional. Tips, tricks, techniques, methods. Um, uh, you know, I mean, what other words you want to use? The tradecraft is the how of the second realm.